Joel, as I mentioned, is the president of the Mohawk Valley Astronomical Society. We also have Faith Thompson, Dan Zabo, Don Yako, um, Kurt Weinstroer, and Carolyn Chuck Higgins from back there. So there's a lot of folks listening in from central New York. Um, I think pretty much everybody else are our local club members. Um, again, Brian is the president of BCAS Black Canyon here. Uh, they're a dark sky site, so that's pretty awesome. So I will introduce Vic, our speaker for tonight. First, I want to welcome everybody to the December, not in person, unfortunately, online club meeting. Um, and I will introduce our speaker. And afterwards, we'll have a little bit of club business so everybody else can stay online or log off if they don't want to hear our exciting club business. So our speaker tonight, is it pronounced Maris, Vic Maris? Maris, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, and Vic's program is entitled Making and Observing with World-Class Optics. And a little bit about Vic, he's, uh, we've already chatted with him and he's pretty fascinating and has a lot of history in astronomy, but Vic made his first reflecting telescopes back in the mid 1960s and he has two inch itis. So he kept making telescopes that were larger and larger in increments of two inches. Since he loved viewing the planets, and this he's admitting that this was way back when we thought Mars had canals, he decided to grind, polish, and figure a five inch F15 refractor at the age of 16. He had completed an eight inch F520 classical Cassegrain in his late teen years, and then went off to work in state parks for 30 years as a park ranger and superintendent. I'm sure he's got a lot of cool stories about that. As he neared <laughs> retirement, he found himself teaching astronomy at the Learning Exchange in Sacramento just for fun. And it was during these classes that his students urged him to start a telescope company. So 22 years ago, Vic formed Stellar View specializing in making high-end refractors. Vic will talk about the trials and tribulations of producing world-class optics, take us on a tour of the Stellar View optical shop, and describe why after more than 50 years, his passion for the night sky remains. And I'm sure we have a lot of folks here who are into observing and a lot who are into astrophotography. And everybody be nice to Vic, because he also is a uh, our Vice President Isaac Garfinkel's boss, so be real nice to Vic. <laughs> so I am going to actually make you the host, Vic, so that you can share your screen. If there's any hacking or anything, you or Chris will have to end the meeting because I won't technically be the host anymore. So okay. let me find you here on, um, all right, I have to go up on my list. Where is everybody? And I am going to make you the host. So now you will be able to share your screen and I hope everybody enjoys the <clears throat> presentation because it's going to be an awesome one. Go ahead, Vic. Oh, I don't know how, I don't know about how awesome it's going to be. Uh, no, I, I do this a lot. It's kind of fun. I, I think the thing is that's really neat about doing these talks with clubs is that we're all the same. You know, all of us, all of us have the same, you know, passion for the night sky and we all have this obsession with the stars that most people don't understand. Um, so what I wanted to talk about a little bit was, you know, why do we do this? And then I'll do a little history on, on the telescope. I like to do that, be, uh, the history of the telescope a little bit, because it kind of defines what the problems were and how they, how they changed the, how telescopes work. And uh, so it's just a good vehicle to work our way up to world-class refractors. So I'm going to share the screen with a PowerPoint presentation. And um, we'll see if uh, this works. Is that working? Yes. Well, how about that? Yes. Um, you know, Zoom usually spend the first half hour just trying to get everybody connected. So, <laughs> um, what I what I do, I do give this talk sometimes to clubs. I love to go out to clubs, and COVID has really affected the ability for me to do this, and the ability for you know Isaac to do star parties, which. He really wants to do, uh, and I really want him to do. I so remember those. Get there. What? I was I saying I remember those. They used yeah, to I do. Fun. Yeah, they were they were nice. Uh, but you know they'll be back. I think I think we'll probably have vaccines rolling around at the by the end of the summer at least. And you know I think that's going to be cool. So we have to look look forward. 
Um, you know, the thing is, though, why is it we do what we do? Um, you know, some people think we're crazy. We stand out there in the, in the middle of the night looking up at the sky, sometimes in shirt sleeves and freezing weather. And so, you know, the question is, are we insane? And it's, it's a good question. We might just be crazy. Um, but, you know, we know why we're doing it. And it's like Sarah Williams said in her poem, I love the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. In our case, we're not afraid of being called nerds. You know, it's just because we, we have this passion with the night sky and there's nothing like it when you look up at the universe. And astronomers are kind of strange, you know, like when someone, you know, comes up and he, you tell them they're into astronomy and instead of asking what sign you are, he asks you what your favorite nebula is. This part of my life is called happy. You know, that there are people out there that know about astronomy. And Robert Burnham Jr., not too far from Colorado, I mean, he worked in Arizona, um, is one of us. I mean, he was an astronomer um, at Lowell Observatory and he had quite a passion for all of this. And he thought about things like, are we insane? Uh, that's why I kind of mentioned him. <clears throat> in the 60s, he created the Burnham Celestial Handbook. And I actually have the first version, which was a loose leaf notebook. He never made the second notebook, so I only have half the sky in that one. But then later, of course, Dover Publications came in and they, they made the entire handbook series. And it's just really great. It's very nostalgic for me to look at this and to think about growing my knowledge through astronomy. And he wrote something really, I thought, fascinating in his introduction to the book. Um, he talked about how some people think that we're trying to escape from reality by looking at the stars. And yet sometimes it happens, perhaps because of the very real aesthetic appeal of astronomy and the almost incomprehensible vastness of the universe, that the more solidly practical and duller mentalities tend to see this study as an escape from reality. Only the most uh, myopic minds would identify reality solely with the doings of man on this planet because contemporary civilization, whatever its advantages and achievements is characterized by many features, which are to put it very mildly, disquieting. To turn from this increasingly artificial and strangely alien world is to actually escape from unreality and to return to the timeless world of the mountains, the sea, the forests, and the stars is to return to sanity and to truth. When you have this kind of inspiration, I mean, what got me into astronomy was the golden book of astronomy. I, I have it still. I don't know how many of you uh, grew up reading Horace Ackerman's famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, but I was in, into monsters as a young kid back in the 60s, and they had an issue called sci-fi, and a neighbor came in, and uh, she saw me with this sci-fi magazine, and she goes, oh, you're interested in space. Well, I have a book I want to bring you, and she leaves, goes home, comes back, and she brings me, you know, the golden book of astronomy, the big, the big book written in 1952, and uh, I thumbed through it and looked at the pages, and that kind of got me into, interested in astronomy, uh, especially when you look at some of the paintings that they have in that book, and it really speaks to the inspiration that we feel when we're looking up at the night sky. But we have to actually own the fact that we're strange. I think that's important. You know, we're not normal. Um, when we, we, we have telescopes on the brain, you know, we see telescopes, there was a funny Facebook post where somebody was throwing away a carpet and, and an astronomer drove by and said, wow, somebody's getting rid of a Dobsonian. What, I wonder what that's, that's about. You know, so we tend to see things that aren't quite exactly what we think they are. And we look at telescopes a lot. We, we are interested in telescopes. And so I think a brief history of the refractor might be a good thing to, to start with. And some of this will be review for a lot of you, I know it. I'm hoping I'm gonna bring up some new things that maybe you didn't understand. I'm gonna get through it rather quickly. It's just a real brief look. But you know, it was uh, Hans uh, Lippershe that made the first telescope, we think. Um, he was a spectacle maker. Some theory has it that his kids were playing with a couple of lenses and they were the first to notice that you could actually see something upside down and magnified. And he tried to apply for a patent for it, but it, he was refused. And, he referred to the telescope as a uh, Kuiper, which means looker, 
or peeper in Dutch. And I think to myself sometimes, you know, when you're out in your backyard and you're looking over your neighbor's roof with your big telescope, aren't you glad we don't say that we're using a peeper, you know, because that, that would be bad. I think. So that's a little humor. It's okay. You can laugh or <laughs> ignore me, whatever. Um, but of course, Galileo was the one who made and used a telescope for astronomy. And if you have the opportunity to go to Florence, Italy, you can go to the Galileo Museum, which is amazing. And in that little museum is the holy grail of amateur astronomy, Galileo's first lens. It's now cracked, but many historians think this was the lens that he used to discover the moons of Jupiter and such. Um, uh, we don't know for sure. We don't even know for sure if this was the lens, but just to go there and look at that, it's pretty amazing you know, to me. Um, I, I tried to go there uh, when COVID hit Italy, just before COVID hit Italy, I, we had arranged uh, to go to Padua and I was going to find Galileo's backyard where he had actually discovered the moons of Jupiter and such. And I wanted to take a picture of that because that would have also been the holy grail of amateur astronomy. The first backyard astronomer lived here. And I just thought that was pretty cool. Other thing about uh, the Galileo Museum is they have a relic. You know, when Galileo was buried as a heretic, well, they, the church finally got realized, okay, this might have been a mistake, and they dug him up and moved him into a non-heretic grave. And it was custom back then to take relics when you did that. And so a few of his bones were removed when they did that. And the Galileo Museum has his middle finger on display, and I swear it's pointed directly at the Vatican, but you know, I'm not sure about that. But um, anyway, it's there, you can see it. Um, it's, while I was there, my wife stopped me and she said, don't move, and she took a picture. And I was standing in front of the bust of Galileo. And it's kind of hilarious because I play Galileo at NEEP every year, comically. I do kind of a Saturday Night Live version, you know, Father Guido Sarducci version of Galileo. And she took this shot and I thought, okay, maybe I'm more Italian than I thought I was. So I don't know. <laughs> Getting back to reality here, Galileo, of course, with that telescope, discovered, I mean, when you think of the things he saw when he first started using that telescope, he made all these discoveries that were just ready to be, to be made. He saw that the moon wasn't perfect, that it had, you know, craters and mountains. And of course, he thought the Maria were seas. So he referred to them as seas, thinking that they were there and there were oceans and that type of thing. Well, he didn't know. He saw the phases of Venus, which was amazing. The four moons of Jupiter, which we call the Galilean satellites, he referred to them as the Medici planets. So, uh, and that was a good thing to do because the Medici family was very influential. And of course, Galileo ended up being the chief mathematician in Florence, even though he was less qualified than some other applicants. He saw sunspots, and from those, he was able to plot out the rotational period of the sun. He looked at the Milky Way, and he saw it wasn't just a cloud in the sky. It was made up of a multitude of stars. And he looked at Saturn, and he noticed something was going on, but his telescope couldn't really resolve what it was. So he made all these amazing discoveries with the first telescope. But that first telescope, like all of the first telescopes back then, only used a single element objective. And that single element objective was not sharp whatsoever because white light we know is made up of all the different colors combined and when light passes through a prism it separates the lights the light into its component colors and that is called dispersion so we'll be talking about dispersion today and so i want to point out that that's what dispersion is it's dispersing the colors spreading out the colors uh, of white light in a single element telescope, the color error is excessive because that single piece of glass acts like a prism and each color comes to focus at a different place. And so on the left there, you can see a star and really only the green is in focus. Everything else is totally out of focus. Um, the dispersion in these early refractors uh, was improved if they made them very, very long. And so it, it wasn't really fixed by any means. It was just a little bit better. So they tended to uh, make these telescopes very long. And as you can see with the inset there, that's a picture of Galileo's objective. He had to really stop it down 
to make it effectively a long focal ratio to get a little better color correction, but it made it a very tiny telescope, really. In fact, you know, Johann Hevelius uh, made a six inch refractor. Well, this is what they looked like with single element lenses. It was 150 feet long. And just to make sure that everybody's clear on this, this is not a grab and go telescope. It required a lot of people to get it to work. And the color correction was pretty horrible. You can, you, you may have heard of the term color um, crossings when we're, when we're dealing with telescopes that people will say, you know, acromats have two color crossings and, but you have to have an apochromat, you have to have a color free telescope. It's gotta have at least three color crossings. And a lot of people don't know what color crossings is. So I've devised a way of explaining this to an amateur <laughs> astronomer who uses a telescope. So on the left, uh, that axis, it's wavelength. It's the different colors in the spectrum. And on the bottom axis, it's your position of your focuser. So negative 10 is the focuser racked all the way in on your telescope. Zero, it's halfway out. And plus 10, the focuser draw tubes racked all the way out. So this is how Galileo's telescope would color correct. It would have one color crossing. It only had one color in focus at any one time. So you focus the green and everything else is out of focus. And that's why these telescopes were so limited in what they could do. Newton comes along and Newton was a big deal. You know, I mean, they, they named a fig after him and everything. Newton in 1668, I'm glad to see that Brad's laughing occasionally. You're, you're gonna be my, I can see you here, Brad, and I'm gonna <laughs> use you. If you're not laughing, I'm gonna keep moving on. If you're laughing, I'll let it go. So Newton invented the reflecting telescope, the Newtonian reflector. And he claimed that false color could never be corrected in a lens. And Newton carried a lot of weight. So he, most people believed him because when he, if he said it, they thought it was true. So what Newton didn't realize is that if you combine lenses that disperse colors differently, you can put them together and they will cancel out their you know, respective dispersive properties. So it was possible to make a color-free refractor. And there was a small group of people that were out there trying to do this. It was kind of a, it was kind of like a moon, moon launch of the day, you know, trying to get, uh, figure out how you could do this. One of the people who were experimenting with this was an attorney uh, by the name of Chester Moore Hall. And he decided that if he was to combine flint and crown glass together, the, the flint disperses light one way, the crown the other way, that this would improve color correction. And so he was an attorney, so he wanted to patent this idea if it worked. So what he did was he contracted with two different optical companies. Um, he gave one optical company the design for the crown element and one optical company the design for the flint element, thinking he'd keep the secret. You know, that was good. So he did that. Well, unbeknownst to him, they both subcontracted the workout to the same guy. And his name was George Bass. So Bass gets two orders simultaneously to make lenses of the identical diameter. And they sort of like fit together. So after he finished them, he put them together, took a look and sure enough, he saw that it worked. And so Bass learned the secret. Now, for some reason, Paul did, never did apply for a patent. Life probably got busy. You know, he was probably really busy on his Facebook page, that kind of thing. So he just didn't get around to, you know, see, I'm watching you, Brad. He just didn't get around to, um, to doing uh, the patent. But you have to, re oh, and by the way, this is how it looks now as far as two color crossings go. You can see that now you have two areas, two points in which the, the, objects are in focus. And so the acromat was a huge improvement over the, over the singlet. And really the only problem that you have is way down on the right there where you're still in visual light, but, it's, but the color is not corrected. You're way out of focus in the purple. And so acromats have that purple fringe. They have two color crossings and that's not enough to create a color-free image. So Bass knows the secret. Hall didn't really pursue a patent. So in the late 1750s, Bass mentions Hall's lenses to John Dolan, who was a businessman. He owned a carpet uh, business. He was big in the carpet industry. He had a lot of money. 
So he applied, he, he made one of these lenses. He had uh, uh, Bass make one of these lenses. They tested it, it worked. He started making telescopes. And so he applied for a patent, John Dolan, and he was granted this patent in 1758. So he was the only game in town for a while, although a lot of lawsuits entailed. And think about it. You no longer had to have your telescope 150 feet long. You could make a telescope as fast as F F16. And that was a good deal, you know, back in those days. Uh, it, was, it was a lot easier to handle. The person who made the truly color-free refractor was Ernst Abba. Uh, Ernst Abba headed the Zeiss company, so he had cred. Um, he was a designer, he was an inventor, he was an engineer, and he was basically just a genius. And he did all kinds of things and developed all kinds of standards in the optical industry. One of the things I really like about him was that he reorganized Zeiss and he gave his workers a living wage to professionalize them, to give them pride in their company. And that really changed how Zeiss operated, which was really awesome. He invented the first color-free microscope in 1868, but it took 10 elements of standard glass to get to color-free performance, which he coined the phrase apochromat. And so we call truly color-free refractors now apochromat. He also did something else that was amazing. He, he took uh, a fluorite crystal and he made it into a lens and he developed the first extra low dispersion glass, a fluorite lens. And fluorite's kind of cool because it, it minimizes the amount of dispersion. So you can actually make an apochromat with uh, an ED lens if you have only two or three elements. And so that, that was quite a, an amazing thing. Of course, we've come a long way from fluorite crystal now. Fluorite crystals are very fragile. Um, it can get mold, there's some issues with it. So we now have synthetic fluorite, which is like O'Hara FPL 53, Hoya FCD 100 and so forth. These all allow you to make a two element APO if it's a long enough focal length and a three element APO if it's shorter. And this is how it works. Look at that, you've got three color crossings and you basically have every color in focus. You cannot tell the difference in color correction between it and a reflector. So there are color-free refractors out there. And I know many amateur astronomers that have had their reflectors for decades and they've never looked through something other than an acromat. And they, don't, they aren't even aware of the fact that we have these incredible telescopes that create beautiful color-free images. So let's review. Acromat means no color. Compared to a single element lens, sure, it has no color, but it, there is that purple fringe. Apochromat means no color, and this time we mean it. Um, so that lens brings the three widely spaced colors to a common focus, and you're truly color free. I'd like to thank Ed Ting for that joke about no color, and we mean it this time. He wrote an article, and that really cracked me up, because that really is the fact. So now that we understand how the refractor evolved, let's think of the look at the differences between true APO refractors and reflectors. Oh, we're getting into dangerous territory now. This is the stuff Cloudy Nights was made for, you know, these arguments between one faction and the other. And let's also look at true APO refractors versus the imposters. And they're out there. So here we go. You know, we see this guy everywhere. So uh, obviously reflectors are better than refractors. They're bigger, right? They gather more light. Reflectors in the real world are color free. So wham, you got that taken care of with just a single element. They cost less. Yeah, that's a big deal. They have, a, they have lower contrast because they've got that secondary mirror in the way. But if the primary mirror is exceptionally figured, you can really minimize that loss of contrast. It's pretty striking what, for example, a reflector with a Mike Lockwood mirror will how it will perform in contrast compared to say a GSO mirror from Taiwan that's mass produced. Um, it really does increase um, contrast. I remember buying a Coulter 13.1 inch reflecting telescope from Coulter Optical Company when I first worked at Red Rock Canyon and that thing had absolutely no contrast whatsoever. It was horrible. The mirror was dog biscuited because the guy was making telescopes very inexpensively. 
So the mirrors were done really quickly. Made a big difference. Reflectors show a varying degree of detail on the planets, and that depends on the optics that are in them and the conditions. Uh, for example, you know, if the wind's blowing, you're going to have tube currents, that, that type of thing. Uh, reflectors may require assembly on site and collimation. We all know this. Generally, that requires lifting and transporting heavier components, but this is the telescope to buy. If you're willing to set up and haul a large telescope, you have it set up in your backyard, you're under dark skies and you really want to enjoy deep sky objects. You're not going to see Stefan's Quintet with one of my refractors very well at all. <laughs> so light matters, uh, particularly in deep sky observing. On the other hand, uh, true Apple refractors perform without needing any columnation ever. They provide the very highest contrast because there is no secondary obstruction. They perform free of tube currents seen in open tube telescopes. They show extremely fine details on the planets because they're apochromat, meaning they're very well corrected. They are limited when looking at faint deep sky objects because they, uh, they, they just don't have the light grasp, but they provide an extremely wide field of view. They allow the user to actually exceed Dawes limit. You can go to 100 power per inch under a steady sky. They show all of this in a relatively small, compact and transportable package, but as we all know, they'll empty your wallet. So there's trade-offs. And that's why most of us in this hobby have reflectors. Uh, the refractors have six elements you have to polish to extremely high optical accuracy. They take a long time. Now, according to Ernest Cobb, an APO objective is, is an objective. An APO is an APO if it's color corrected par focally with three widely spaced wavelengths as we've shown and if it's corrected for spherical aberration and coma in two widely spaced wavelengths. Now, spherical aberration is basically when uh, a lens is not polished very well or figured very well, and light doesn't focus uh, uh, the same at the edge of the lens as it does in the center. And coma is that thing you see when you have your F4 reflector and you put in a nice wide angle Nagler and you don't have a coma corrector <laughs> because telescopes, reflectors under F6 do need a coma corrector. Hi, Gwen. To eliminate. It's also the same for images from a refractor. Nope. You're doing it without a field flag. Could, could people please remember to mute their microphones if they're uh, not speaking? I'm kind of getting into your conversations, actually. So, uh, probably not a good thing. Um, so and Vic, you can actually, as the host, you can mute people if you see the where the voices are coming from. You can actually mute it from your end. You mean I have that kind of power? You have that power. Wow. I only see about four people over here. I don't know how. So, Michelle. Yep. If Hello. someone's having trouble, it's just there's a little button down in the left-hand corner of the screen with a little microphone symbol. Uh, uh, I should say mute, and you just click I, right on that. I muted you, Michelle. Don't take or let Vic do it. Um, I, well, I, you know, I just, she wanted that. Never mind. Let's move on. Um, so based on Ernst Bob's definition, can an apo with not notable spherical aberration be an apochromat? If your telescope has noticeable spherical aberration, can it be an apochromat? No. Correct. According to Ernest Ob's definition, it's corrected for spherical aberration in two widely separated wavelengths. It's going to be clearly well corrected, has to be really well corrected. And yet, there's a lot of telescopes out there that say APO, and they have horrible spherical aberration. The problem is explaining color crossings to a judge in court. <laughs> is never going to be possible. So basically, these companies are getting away with it. So the sad truth is your APO may not be a true APO. And it's going to make a difference. How do you tell? Uh, you star test it is one way. Uh, okay. We use a, a half a million dollar <laughs> test machine here, a Zygo interferometer, which, we, which we'll get into a little bit later. But uh, you can do a star test. And if you look at a star and it's in focus and you focus inward and you make a blur circle, 
and you see little lines and then you back off to where you're in focus and then you back focus to where it's the same size and you see now it looks a lot softer than the one on the inner side, inside of focus or one side or the other is softer, doesn't look identical, then you have some spherical error. And uh, that can be measured on, on, on zygos and, and machines like that. On, but it's not something you could see like when you were focusing this telescope. No, no, it's not. It's not. Okay. There's three things that are really important to make a world-class telescope. You gotta have material compatibility, both optical and mechanical. You have to have high optical glass quality and you have to have optical accuracy. It has to be, you know, polished and figured very accurately. To give you an example of how you have incompatibility with materials is if a telescope is over a 130 or larger, it really needs to have the lens put into a steel cell. And that's because glass expands and contracts at a certain rate, very close to the rate of expansion and contraction of steel. Aluminum expands and contracts all over the place. And it's okay if you have a four and a half inch refractor or smaller, because it doesn't really make that much difference. But when you get up to about 130, as LZOS in Russia under, uh, discovered, and they make spy satellite lenses, they make guided missile lenses, they have to be sharp and they have to maintain sharpness. They knew they had to go to steel. And so that's one important factor. Um, another factor is the glass type, and the gla uh, not the glass type, the glass quality. Um, there's all kinds of aberrations that can be formed in when glass is being made and cheap glass doesn't have very good homogeneity. And what I mean by the word homogeneity is just consistency. So you see in the picture there, on the left is a grade A piece of glass. It's very consistent. On the right is a C grade glass that has short range inhomogeneity. You can see striae, these things that were formed because the glass cooled too quickly. Less expensive import telescopes are often made with grade C glass. So that's going to be a problem. But on the internet, you know, when people go on cloudy nights or various chat rooms, they always ask the same question. Is it made with FPL 53? Yeah. We make our, our lenses with FPL 53 just so we can answer yes. You can make a, a telescope that's perfectly color corrected and performs beautifully with a lot of other types of glasses. But they think that's the question to ask. What they should be asking is what grade of glass is it made with? Because that's what's going to make the difference. The other thing, of course, is optical accuracy. It's got to be made very accurate. And if you look through a telescope that has a very accurately figured mirror, for example, you can tell the difference immediately. Optics use curved surfaces to bend the light and the accuracy of the wave front, uh, the accuracy of each lens will determine how sharp the image is, basically. And when we're doing optics, we measure the accuracy of the spherical surface in terms of wavelengths of light. We don't try to do it in terms of a fraction of an inch because it would be too minuscule to even comprehend. Um, a wavelength of light, two, a, a piece of paper is 200 waves thick. And yet the optical wave front of a truly world-class Apo has to be figured accurately to a very small fraction of one. So it has to be extremely accurate. And that's why we take six months on each one of our objectives figure them to a high optical standard. So what's the real world result of having more accurate optics? I'm always asked this. Somebody buys a telescope and they go, well, my seeing isn't very good here, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, maybe. Um, if it's really sharp, though, it'll snap to focus. And during those moments of steady air, planets will pop into, into, into tight focus. I want to take you to a night that I had in the Sierra, right up here at Blue Canyon. Our astronomy club meets, and you know we had about 50 telescopes on the hill. It was 1985 or 86, and I hauled along my eight-inch mead because I had made telescopes. I had made an eight-inch F520 Casagrin, but I had gone off to work in parks and I sold it, and I had missed having a telescope, and I didn't have the time to make one, so I bought a, an eight-inch SCT. We had about 50 people on the hill that night, and while we were observing, I heard somebody say, we're having super seeing. 
Now, superseding is when the air is sub arc second. It's very steady and you get to see things you've never dreamed of before, particularly for somebody like me who really likes the planets. So I looked through my telescope and I said, no, it's not superseding. I mean, I'm looking at Saturn just the way I always see it. I can barely make out Cassini's division. You know, there's some planetary detail, but I don't consider this to be super seeing. And the guy said, said well, come over here and look through my scope. And I go, well, well how big is your scope? He goes, it's six inches. I went, well, I don't think. I said, who made your scope? He goes, Rowan Christian. It's an astrophysics refractor. I went, oh, I always wanted to look through one of those. So I looked through Rowan's, and this, these are general impressions. And Saturn showed me that we were under super seeing conditions. Um, you could see multiple rings. You could see, uh, I, I swear at times I thought I saw spokes. People say you can't do that unless you have a 22 inch telescope. This thing was sharp. And so we decided since it was such a steady night that we would do a survey. And we had everybody on the hill point their telescopes at Saturn. And we tried to approximate the same power. And we went and looked through everybody's telescopes. 50 telescopes, only four on the hill that night showed us that we were under perfect seeing conditions. The astrophysics, F12, APO refractor, a galaxy mirrored uh, obsession telescope. The guy had a very good, very good mirror. You could see it, it was like a Hubble image. And then two other reflectors that were made with Pegasus mirrors, John Hall, the late John Hall, who made very exceptional mirrors. Every other telescope, all the commercial uh, SCTs, um, all, the other, all the other telescopes that people had, the, the import um, reflectors that they had purchased. Now remember, this is back in 85 and the telescope industry has done improvements since then, but none of the rest of the telescopes could resolve to that level. And I was very impressed and I remember thinking to myself, you know, if I ever have a telescope company, I'm going to make refractors because they're always in alignment. You know, every time I come to the star party, I had to walk around with a Cheshire and a laser to get everybody's reflector in alignment and stuff. So I would do that for people. And uh, I, 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 that, that view through the, the astrophysics refractor was pretty inspiring to me. There is a difference in telescopes that translate to visual inspiration. A, a telescope like an SCT is a very valuable tool. It, it, it's, it's valuable if it's used in the proper places. You don't look at Stefan's Quintet through a 130 refractor. You're not gonna see much. You use an 11 inch Schmidt, for example. But these big Schmidts, I don't think look very, certain objects don't look quite as, quite as good. And I like to go out to star parties that are in national parks being a former park ranger. And I like to bring a 130 or a 152 refractor with me. Um, and I usually try to set up next to the park services, 11 inch Schmidt. And I try to convince them that, okay, it may not be as impressive, but you really should be looking at like M81 and M82. You should look at M51 because you'd know, be able to actually show people the spiral structure and stuff. But you're looking at a globular cluster and a globular cluster through an SCT, yeah, it's fully resolved but through an apochromat, it's stunning. So it's a different thing. And so we use telescopes for different purposes visually. People that have big reflectors often have a nice apochromat as well. And they use that to view the planets and, and just to see things that are a little sharper and a little different. Um, but again, you're not gonna use it for super deep sky object telescopes. So how do you measure accuracy? Well, the best way to measure it is uh, using Strill Ratio. Strill Ratio was invented by Carl Strill, and it basically is a measurement of the intensity of light that's in the airy disk, the center part of the star that you look through at, say, 200 power. So this gets back to your question about how do you star test. One way you can star test is just to look at a star, if, if the airy disk, if that first diffraction ring is really bright going around it, you have spherical error because you're, you 83% of the light should be in the disk, 7% should be in the first ring, and less than 3% in the rest. 
And if that doesn't happen, if most of that light's flooding into the diffraction rings, then you have spherical error. If you had a, tel a telescope that could produce this, you would have a strill ratio of 1.0, which would be a perfect optic and perfect is impossible in the universe. So you can get close to 1.0, but that would be a perfect optic. A serial ratio of 9.5 is a very high rating, and it's, it makes sure that 90, it, basically it's saying that 95% of the light is going where it's supposed to go. And lenses that meet this standard include the, Zerm, the German Zeiss telescopes, and I know Russian LZOS telescopes, that was their standard for many years, 9.5 or better. Mass-produced commercial telescopes that we've tested in our shop on our Zygo range from about, um, well, they usually come in at, at, they usually come in at between 0.8 and 0.92. That's where we've measured them. And we've, we have all this data that we've accumulated. We have measured them as low as 0.70. Um, that, that, that telescope needed to be turned into a doorstop. The, Target standard for Chinese telescopes, according to, and this is according to the, the engineers that I've talked to in China, is 0.9 strill. It'll look good looking through a 0.9 strill telescope, but there may be issues that are involved with it. We use this machine, this Zygo laser interferometer, and all of our telescopes from four inches and up are 0.99 strill. To get them to 0.99 strill, we have to spend about six months. So, and we use the Zygo, people think, oh, you use the Zygo to document when you're done. No, we use the Zygo on each surface and we use the Zygo continuously to, fit, to figure the lenses and to take care of any minor issues that we see. You know, if we, well, I'll show you some of the test reports we have and that'll, that'll help. But, thrill ratio is not everything. You've got to also have a real low number when it comes to astigmatism, coma and tree file, these errors, you've got to have them really pushed down so that they're not even visible, um, in addition to a high strill ratio to have a world-class lens. So let's take a look at some test reports and I can show you how this machine works. <clears throat> See, there's that guy again. <laughs> so here's a, a lens that come off of our polishing machines. And this is the wavefront of what we would normally have sold um, as, an, as a refractor. Because up until about three years ago, uh, we were not figuring our lenses the way we are now in-house. We are not hand figuring and we are not bringing them up to an extremely high standard. What caused us to do this was that we got a lens off the machine that was above 9.8 strill. And when Alex put it on the test bench and looked through it, he goes, oh my goodness. Well, he didn't say goodness, referring to a deity. But at any rate, I went and looked and you could tell the difference. That central area disc was brilliant. We decided we wanna go above 9.8 from now on. So we started really spending time and hand figuring. So this is a test report of a telescope that we would sell before we made that change. You can tell in our line if a telescope is hand figured or not in that we call it either an SV, like in, in this case, this is a, I don't know which one this is, I don't have the thing listed. Like we would call it an SV 130. If it's a 130 that was made three years ago or earlier, but if it's an SVX 130, it was made in the last three years, that's going to have 9.9 strial. So this wouldn't be acceptable by us anymore. Let me show you an example of a bad telescope optic. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> one that you can see the strial ratio is 0.8. <clears throat> you can see the first disc, the first uh, diffraction ring is very bright. So this is an optic. <clears throat> that has a lot of spherical error. Now you'll notice, <clears throat> I'm going to go back here. You'll notice that the, the oblique plot, which is this, um, this picture right here, <clears throat> looks smoother. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> My asthma. 
for those of you who are in the audience that are younger, like Isaac, don't get old. Anyway, you'll notice that, that the oblique plot, it looks smoother than if we look at the first one. That one looks rougher. And yet that one is a 975. Nine, Whereas the next one I showed you was 0.8. Why does it look rougher? Well, if you look up here, you're only, we're magnifying a very small difference. So what, what, what the machine does is every time you put a lens in of a different optical accuracy, it adjusts how it presents the shape. And so in this case, it's, there's very little difference between the low spots and the high spots because it's such an accurate lens. So having this look rough is actually a good thing um, because it means that you're getting down to like sub strill, you know, sub one or over 0.99 strill. So there's very little difference in the, in the thing. So here's an example of spherical error. And what you want to look for in the test report is, does that first diffraction ring look fat? Are these bars exactly straight or are they curved, showing spherical error? And let's take a look at the peak to valley of this one. This one has a value, a peak to valley of about a half wave. Peak to valley is a measurement of the very lowest part and the very highest part of a lens. Peak to valley is not the best rating to use in uh, evaluating if a lens is good. RMS is, which is the average. But peak to valley of a half wave is pretty horrible. So that's an example of spherical error. Here's an example of astigmatism. This telescope has a very interesting history. A customer bought a 130, another brand, and he said, and he bought our reducer flattener for it. And he goes, this reducer flattener doesn't work. My images look horrible. I said, really? Um, it, it can't. I mean, these things are really, we make these here. They're, they're excellent. And he said, no, these images are terrible. And he showed me some images. And I said, yeah, that looks pretty bad. He goes, well, I was hoping to image at Joshua Tree this next weekend, I go, are you at nightfall at Joshua Tree, which is an event they have there every winter? And he goes, yeah. I go, well, I'm giving a talk there. I said, I'll bring some eyepieces, because he told me he doesn't view with eyepieces. And I'll come and I'll take a look through your scope. So I came down and I looked through his scope. I could tell by looking visually with an eyepiece that this thing had horrible problems. And this is the actual test result of that lens. It has astigmatism. Astigmatism is where the wavefront is shaped like a potato chip. And you can see down here that it's, it's astigmatic. If you were to focus stars, they would look like crosses. And if you focus in on one side, you have, an, you have like an oval going this way. And if you focus out on the other side, you have an oval going this way. A sure sign of astigmatism. It means something's really, really wrong. And in this case, we had more than that. We had tree fall, we had other issues. Because if we were to take care of that astigmatism, which of course we wouldn't do, it wasn't our, our lens, um, other problems like trefoil would pop up. Let me point out to you what trefoil is. Trefoil is when you're looking through a telescope and the stars appear as triangles. See, it's got kind of a triangular shape. Trefoil it happens for a few reasons. It can happen if the glass has long range in homogeneity, or it can happen if you have a retaining ring that's too tight on your lens. It can actually deform the glass or in this case, you didn't polish correctly and you have three low spots. And so with three low spots, you're gonna end up with triangular stars. It's just not gonna be as sharp. And so even though this is a nine six drill, this lens, it's gotta be rejected because it has trefoil. And that trefoil could be caused by homogeneity or it could be caused by po bad polishing techniques. I have the feeling it was bad polishing techniques that caused that. Exactly. Yeah. I have a question. What about quality control? I mean, are, are these mass produced uh, or individually made? Because if it's a big company like Celestron, for example, what's the quality control parameters? I think quality control parameters have really improved with commercial companies like Celestron. Um, based on what I've seen, just based this, just, I have no idea what they're doing, but you know, based on what I've seen, some of their uh, optics uh, that I've looked through uh, have looked pretty good. Um, so 
you know, I can tell you exactly how well our lenses perform because I've tested every one of them. I know exactly intimately how well, I know what our range is, for example. Um, I can't tell you about other companies because the telescopes that come in our door, and we've tested about a hundred different telescopes uh, so far uh, that customers have brought in. Um, you know, I don't know if it's something the customer did or if, if that's the way it was. And we also have to consider when the telescope was made because telescopes made 25 years ago aren't as good as they are today. But I will say this, we made a big difference in our production when we went from machine polished lenses to individually figured lenses. We were able to really attack the issues because with a machine polished lens, you know, about as good as we could get reliably was about 9.2 strill, 9.5 strill, somewhere in there. And with, by figuring it, uh, we were able to get it up above 9.9. So yeah, quality control. I think one of the biggest factors is what'd you pay for it? You know, I have a guy that comes into the booth at NEEF every year that he's really upset because he bought another cheap telescope and it doesn't perform well. Well, what did you expect? You know, an inexpensive telescope uh, made overseas is not going to perform like a hand-figured American-made optic, you know. And, and if you don't believe me, find yourself a TEC or an astrophysics or a stellar view SVX out in the field and compare it to any of the other refractors and, and you'll see the difference. Um, Vic, a question for you. Um, so it sounds like some of the errors that you've talked, this is Brian Cashin, yep. some of the errors that you talked about um, with the stigmatism or chromatic aberration, uh, it would seem that they can be corrected by improved figuring on the lens that you've got. It would seem like for trifoil, where it's in the glass itself, that that's a lost cause. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's there's, um, um, there's a number of factors. Now, first of all, you said color correction. And if you're using low dispersion glasses, you're probably going to get fairly good color correction. But what I'm talking about is how sharp is the image? And how contrasty is the image? And do you have these aberrations that are visible to the naked eye? And if you do, I mean, because all lenses have astigmatism. You go out, you go from the center to the edge, you're going to find that the lens is astigmatic on the edge because that's that's the laws of physics. What we're talking about is on-axis astigmatism. And if you notice that you have this, if you notice when you focus in and focus out, the star goes this way and then it goes that way, I think you have a poorly figured objective. If you have trefoil, it could be a lot of things. Your retainer ring is too tight. That's an easy fix. Um, it could be that when they were polishing it, they didn't, they used polishing techniques that I'm familiar with that they use in some optical shops, which are not good. I'm not going to explain what they are because I'm not going to sit here and educate my competitors. <laughs> and so there is a figuring, there is a, a, a problem that they encounter and based on how they do it, we've solved that problem. And then it could be the, the, the glass homogeneity, which is a lost cause. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks very much. Appreciate okay. that. Yeah, I mean, because there's so many nuances to this. It's very easy for me to go on cloudy nights and say something and have a thousand people just trash me because they're not taking it in the right context. Oh, you know, you're so a vendor. You're not allowed on cloudy nights. <laughs> that's true. Well, actually I, actually, I go on cloudy nights when they're when there is a conspiracy theory, I usually let it wait for about a year and then I'll go on and I'll just state facts and then they'll lock down the, the thread and then they'll edit my post and then it'll go back up again. Cloudy Nights is doing a much better job of monitoring than it used to. And I really appreciate that because, you know, I, the thing I really hate on chat rooms is when some kid you know, he saves up all of his allowance and he gets a telescope. It's all he can afford. And he goes on and he goes, hey, I just bought this brand X telescope and I'm really enjoying it. And some guy who is, you know, has this high end refractor comes in and nails him. And the kid backs off and he never goes on cloudy nights again. That's just, that's just mean. And so, you know, every, everybody has to start somewhere, you know, and from there, they either are happy with what they have or they progress from there. And so uh, it's, 
And, and so I do appreciate the fact that there's, there's a lot of moderation going on now because it really makes it better for everybody. Um, oh, um, here's, here's a lens that I got from a company that uh, is in China and it was pretty good. And uh, this one came in at nine two drill and uh, I can see a little bit of tree fall. I know that if we were to polish the spherical air down that the tree fall would pop up um, a, a little bit. So you'd be trading. I mean, if it were me, I, and, and we were gonna sell this, which we wouldn't, but if we were, um, I don't think this could be much improved because I can see that tree foil is coming. And once we get it more and more accurate, then it's going to going to pop up. And if it's because of long range inhomogeneity, um, which has happened to me, um, that that can be a problem. Let me let me tell you my sad story. We purchased twenty five FPL fifty three blanks for our one sixties. We purchased the outer elements. And we made 25 160s to a very high optical standard. Back in those days, it was 9.5, uh, but um, it was beautiful. The, 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 the work and the time we spent on them, we got them done. We looked through at a test star and it was triangular. And we know we didn't do anything in polishing to cause that. And we, researched it and we researched it and after about a year we determined that the glass type we were using had long range inhomogeneity and it created the tree foil. We had created 20, it took us a year and we had created 25 wonderful doorstops because we weren't going to get rid of that tree foil. And these are the kinds of things that, that I talk about with my uh, fellow vendors who we, when we, you know, uh, complain, not complain, but when we go, why are we doing this <laughs> to get all this bad glass? Now, in that case, we were able to fix it because they were the outer elements that were bad. And we were able to replace those and, and make it work. Um, I've never had any trouble with uh, O'Hara glass. So that, that, uh, that was one thing. And it was very funny because afterwards, uh, I was talking to Yuri at TEC. He said, oh yeah, we knew that that glass wasn't good years ago. And, and then Roland, you know, years later on, I was talking to him, said the same thing. And it was like, I should have given these guys a call, you know, about this. So uh, anyway, um, this is uh, a test report. It's my last one of uh, 152. It's 995 drill. We made one the other day that was 997. So we're, 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 we're really uh, possessed when it comes to this stuff. And of course, this one looks very rough in the middle because we're only showing a difference of half a drill point. Um, in our in our uh, oblique plot, the lines are absolutely straight. The star is perfectly circular, and these are the way our SVX uh, lenses are are made. Um, so it 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 takes us at least six months to get there, but it's worth it when we get there. And uh, and we realize we're, we're we're priced beyond what most people can afford. But maybe someday they will. Um, you know, it's that kind of thing. And we're we're not trying to get it on volume. We're trying to get it on based on what we do. And I take my inspiration from people like Roland Christian, who pioneered this and uh, really uh, held quality as, as the most important thing. I, uh, I'm going to try this. I told you guys I would give you a tour of the optical shop. And right now, oops, did I just leave? What happened? Hmm. Am I back? There you go. You have the test report showing? Uh, yeah, I think so. Three of them. Okay. Um, I'm going to pull out of the screen share here and I want to give you kind of a video showing our shop. I want to first of all show you the process from hand, from building the tools to curve generating on our CNC machines to polishing to hand figuring. And then from there, I want to take you to the Dark Sky Star Party, which is in likely California. It's the darkest sky in California. And we take our customers there once a year under, you know, magnitude eight skies. Well, let's see if I can get this um, video to, uh, to go. And then I'll answer any questions you might have.
And so welcome to Stellar View. Do you still hear my voice? Yes. Sounds good. Okay. This is O'Hara Glass. This is a space optic that we made. We had to cut it into a disc. And here we are polishing. These are 102s. And this is the Zygo interferometer. We have a half a million dollars worth of test equipment. And so from here, we go to the Dark Sky Star Party out in Likely, California. When John Talbot got his 152, he imaged M33, and he was amazed at the star clusters he could see in that galaxy through a six inch refractor. So that's what we're here for. We're here for the inspiration, really. I mean, it's, it's, we all know what motivates us to do what we do. And, uh, and it's because we're really connected to the universe. So that's the end of the program. And uh, Hello, my name I don't want to hear from that guy. <laughs> is is Oborn <laughs> near San, uh, Sacramento? Is Auburn is near Sacramento. It's about 45 minutes drive. And Just, so we're between Sacramento and Reno. So going up the hill. Yeah, it's going up the hill. So we're okay. in the foothills of the Sierra. Uh, it's kind of nice being in the foothills of the Sierra because we have the laminar flow coming from the Pacific Ocean. And as it works its way up the Sierra and you're on the west side, you often get very steady air. But uh, once you get over the top of the Sierra, it gets pretty choppy, you know. So we do get some pretty steady nights here, which is for me a... I was really into planets. So it's it's uh, kind of neat. Any other questions? I got one there, uh, Vic. So uh, this is Robert, Robert Foster. So the images you just showed um, were stacked, of course. Um, but do you find you get you need less stacking, or is just the result a whole lot better with the kind of optics you use? You know, the the person to ask that question of would be. Uh, uh, an astro imager. And I'm an old guy, so I have a right to not do astro imaging. 
<laughs> so I have people who know about stuff like that. Um, hmm. uh, and uh, I think I hear one of them now, actually. <laughs> Isaac, Isaac, Isaac. Yes. Thing. Go ahead, Someone got muted. I think you. I think you can answer the question better than I can. I. What was the question? Um, so Isaac, this is Robert. So you know the images just shown there in that video were were stacked, um, but you know with the kind of high quality optics here, does that mean a good image can come about with less stacking, or do you still need roughly the same amount and you just get better? Your results? ceiling is going to be higher. Mm -hmm. You know, that's eventually with a lower end scope, you know, you can get 100 hours of data and things won't look as sharp as they would with 100 hours of data through a properly made, properly manufactured high end scope. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, it's not the end of the world, but you're not going to be maximizing what you can get out of your, you know, the rest of your gear, your location, your mount, your camera, whatever mm -hmm. you're processing. So there is, it applies a bit of a ceiling, but it's not a like, you know, I mean, obviously there are really, really bad scopes out there, but we're talking anything, you know, something within reason, you should still be able to take a decent image with. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. So you're not get necessarily gathering more data with the good optics? Well, I find, you know, a, a lot of customers ask, get, get a, like a 152 and they go, wow, I've never, you know, I've never had an image that is, you know, this sharp through a telescope that size. I'll tell you one who, who really, uh, uh, it, it's timely that I would mention this because the picture is right behind me. Um, and that's, you uh, can't really see it with the glare. Tony Hallis and our 152, he got it and he said, I've never seen an optic this sharp. And he was shooting really fine de detail in the Andromeda galaxy. And of course, he was he was uh, he was um, doing a mosaic. And then what he did was in in taking this shot. I'm going to see if I can do this without breaking something. Um, was he used his reflecting telescope to add the color? Um, I'm going to take this over to show you the actual black and white version because that's in our other room and hopefully it will. This is, um, this is our meeting room that we haven't been able to use all year. Uh, <laughs> I can go out here without a mask right now because uh, nobody's, nobody's working right now. Um, the detail in this shot, and the, this was just the refractor, is amazing. Um, and I wish I could show it to you without all the glare. Yeah. But he, he, sh he shows these wings on the ends that he said he never has seen before. And the detail and the structure and the center and everything is just amazing. So he, he told me it was an incredibly uh, sharp image. The colorized version that he made, by the way, uh, right before he died, Steve Jobs bought it um, because he liked it better than any of the Hubble images he looked at. And he used it in the, whenever you see an Apple computer with the line software, you see that image. And so Tony House got $10,000 for that, and I got bragging rights. So I thought that was pretty cool <laughs> and, uh, that he picked that over all the Hubble images that he had. Any other questions? Uh, this is Brian again, uh, Vic. Um, during the video, it showed the way you were figuring or working on your, your lenses. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier that you'd gone from, I guess, totally machine controlled to more handcrafted. Yeah. Um, tell us, it looks like you still use machines a lot, even when you're handcrafting a lens. Can you tell us a bit more about the process there? Um, we've invented a few things, uh, which I'm not really gonna discuss. Um, Fair enough. Uh, so, to attack certain issues that people, my lens designer said, you can't fix this problem, and we fixed them. Because uh, one of the secret we weapons I have is Alex Mayer. He's, he's, um, he's a genius when it comes to this stuff. And he's, so he likes to experiment when people say no to him and do things. And he spends some time doing that, and it's time well spent. Um, 
you know, I talk about making my first refractor when I was 16 years old. I got to tell you, it was horrible. And it's one of the things that got me making reflectors from then on until I started Stellar View. Well, I made one short tube that I shot Holly's Comet through. But it was interesting. I made this telescope and I could not get rid of the false color, no matter what I did. It, I, it had not only the purple fringe, but it had this giant red, you know, false color that I couldn't get rid of. And so after spending a couple of years working on it, I finally ended up making that eight inch F520 classical casagram. And uh, so I was, I, I was, at, I went to Sky and Telescope about, I don't know, it was probably 12, 15 years ago, something like that. And I was addressing the editors for over a lunch meeting. And somebody said, when did you make your first refractor? And I said, well, when I was 16, but it wasn't very good. And one of the editors raised his hands, one of the older gentlemen, I won't use his name, you'll know who he is, but you know, I, I don't have his, his permission, but he goes, was that a kit that you bought from so-and-so company? And I said, yeah, why? He goes, I did the same thing back then. He goes, wrong black. They had the wrong glass. So I spent a couple of years uh, developing my polishing techniques <laughs> with two pieces of glass that were never going to color correct well. And, uh, and so that, that, to me, that's the kind of thing that is interesting. You don't get into this endeavor without um, being able to be extremely frustrated at times from materials that, are, that you buy that you think are good and they're, and they're not. So for what that's worth, you know, it's very interesting that it took me like 30, 40 years to find out that it wasn't my fault. <laughs> Great story, thanks. Uh, Vic, earlier yeah. on, you showed two images of Saturn side by side. It was a huge difference. Right. But one of the things, and it looked like a pretty wide field, I didn't see any moons. Yeah, Ken, I, I want to, uh, and I said this I, kind of briefly when I gave the talk, I think, those are just visual impressions of how it looked, okay? Those were not pictures that we took at that night. It was like, this is what this looked like. This is what that looked like. So. Okay. Hi, Vic, this is Nancy. Um, yeah, Nancy. I just wanted to comment. I, I really enjoyed uh, the whole presentation. And I know you seem to be a big fan of Galileo. I just wanted to mention, I don't know if it was the, Octo the November or December astronomy magazine had a really fascinating article about Galileo and they kind of focused on um, that he was a very talented artist and that his artistic training probably enabled him to envision and interpret a lot of the things that he saw through his telescope and to figure out what they were, such as perspective and shadowing. It's a really fascinating article if anybody's into Galileo that you don't think about. So it's interesting to read that article. That, that's a really interesting point. Uh, he was also a, music, yeah, a musician. Um, his whole family was. Uh, one of the things that uh, the book that I loved was Galileo's Daughter. Uh, if you ever get a chance to read that, I encourage all of you to read that because um, uh, Galileo, Galileo's daughter is interpreted from all of the stuff she wrote him, the letters she wrote him from the convent. The nuns in the convent when she died burned it all like his messages to her because he was a heretic mm. and think of what we lost there, mm. but you can see on his, some of his letters, some drawings, like, like he would be, you know, drawing something, some idea about physics or whatever. And you could see his drops that they thought were for his tears. And, uh, you know, cause he was in prison, basically. He was kept in prison in his home uh, in his later years. And, yeah, they but had that's when he, they actually, Sorry, said, they actually said that his, um, his uh, oh God, the thought just went out of my head. Sorry about that. Um, that his, yeah, his, his interpretations were, were heavily influenced by his, um, he needed to draw things and to, to envision the concept and the idea. So they said yeah. that that's yeah. what allowed him to be able to, to think and to interpret things like that. His, his visuals, his sketches, they said even some of his sketches are actually works of art in and of themselves. Yeah, he, he um, I, I really uh, enjoy portraying him. He 
because he's a classic character, he was dead wrong on some things. And it was so interesting because he and Kepler, you know, disagreed. And so when I'm playing, when I'm, I, when I was teaching astronomy, there would be a time when I'd say, I have a gentleman out here I want to get for you. And I'd go out, I'd quickly put on the scholar's robe and the hat, and I'd come in and I'd be Galileo. Did you have any questions you wanted to ask Galileo? I'm, you know, I'm 400 and some odd years old, but, you know, I'll try to answer the best I can. And people would like want to ask questions of Galileo. But it's so interesting because, you know, Kepler was right. Uh, Kepler knew there, there was a thing called gravity. And Galileo thought it was the the tides were being sloshed around from the rotation of the earth and stuff like that. So he wasn't always right. And I like, I like that in historic characters that you show them as humans, you know, because we all make mistakes, except Isaac. He's perfect. <laughs> well, well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so does anybody else have any questions for Vic? There was a doubt. Fascinating presentation on many levels. And well, thank you. I'm yeah. glad you enjoyed it. And your presentation style and your humor is also pretty incredible. <laughs> it, it's hard when you're not live, though. You I don't know. really know how, because I mean, I had only a few people next to me, and I really appreciated Brad, because when he <laughs> left, I knew I was making a point there. I was getting, it was, it was funny, but you know, it was, it's that kind of thing. You want to, I, I always like to add some comedy to it, because it, it makes it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that and with having a live audience. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we'll get there. We'll get there. You got to think positive, so. Yeah. Well, well, I was chuckling at certain times, so it did a good job. Great. Okay, thanks. Good. I'll, I'll keep working on it, though. <laughs> it's a tough deal. Yeah. Don't quit your day job, though. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there were lots of LOLs. You just couldn't hear them because we were all respectively muted. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, good. Good. I'm glad. I'll keep working on it. Yeah. So, yeah. I've only been doing this for, you know, what, 50 years, so. I'm going to get good at it eventually. So. You must have been a good well, park ranger too, with uh, dealing with the public and people when you were a park ranger as well. It, it was a lot of fun. Uh, when I was in the field, it was a lot of fun. We, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, because I, I, I was a telescope maker. So I had a, my eight inch telescope with me when I worked at Red Rock Canyon. And we posted on the bulletin board, campfire program tonight, view the stars through a telescope. And nobody would show up. So I decided the following weekend, I put the telescope on the back of, a, of the truck, the pickup truck. And it was an eight inch, like F8 reflector that I had made. It was the one I made before the Kazagrin. So I had this, and I'd go around the campground slowly. And then I'd un take it off and put it down. Everybody would show up because they, you know, they visually could see, hey, I'm going to be able to look through that telescope. Uh, um, uh, you know, giving star talks is a lot of fun. It's, it's, just, it's just really enjoyable for me. When and there I, are so many astronomers out there that are really good at it. It's the people that convey their, their, their feelings, um, you know, the, the, that really are able to portray the fascination of what you're looking at to, to get, make you understand what it is you're seeing, you know, yeah. how big this thing is, how far away it is, that type of thing. It's pretty, pretty fun. And, and of course, showing people Saturn through the telescope, they never believe you if they've never seen it before. I remember I had a woman a couple of years ago at, at a star party we did over here um, just in Auburn where she looked at it and she went, no, no. I go, yeah, well, man, that's, and she walked around the front and she looked and she went back. She goes, no, she goes, this is fraud and I don't like it. And she walked away. She's warmed out. <laughs> she was convinced it wasn't real. You know? so yeah. I said, oh, I'll call that a success. People think you glue a little picture in there to fake them out. Exactly. Yeah. And she kept and walking and walked right off the edge of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to admit it. The first time, the first time you looked at Saturn, I mean, wow. And I remember uh, when I had made my little telescope, my uh, the assembled telescope, I, uh, and I, I was waiting for Saturn to come. I was waiting for Saturn to come, and I uh, the the bell rang. It was three o'clock in the morning. Saturn was rising late. And I ran out there with my four inch little reflector that I had assembled from parts and saw Saturn for the first time. And I just stared at it and stared at it. I couldn't believe it. I'm, I was there for a long time. All of a sudden Saturn began to really shake and stuff. And I'm wondering what's going on. And I'm realizing I'm shivering because I'm in my underwear in my backyard. I was so excited. I didn't put my clothes on and I was freezing out there, you know? So yeah, Saturn will do it to you. It adds a lot to a star party, right? When people are in their underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a good idea. Not at our age. 
No. Um, well, at any rate, um, yeah, right. this, this was incredible. Um, we had quite a very big audience tonight for your talk. So it's a fascinating topic for everyone involved. So um, does anybody else have any questions? We certainly all have appreciation for Vic for giving this wonderful presentation. So um, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, if not, Vic, I guess you'll have to find the little icon and make me the host again so I can. Uh, okay, and how do I do that? Some, if you click, if you put your cursor on my picture. Oh, on yours. And yeah. then by those three little dots. Got it. I think you can. Make uh, host, there you go. You can make me. I know how to do this. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Vic. Okay, thank you. Thank you thank all. You. Appreciate, it. Appreciate it. Yeah, so. See you tomorrow. Uh, as I, talk to you tomorrow, Isaac. As I mentioned, we'll, we'll have a little bit of, um, of Western Colorado Astronomy Club business now. So I thank everybody from all the other clubs for participating. But if, if you don't want to be bored by our, by our day to day uh, club business, um, feel free to disconnect. Feel free to stay on if you want to hang with us. And um, it was apparently dinner's ready. So I'm going to back off. Uh, okay. Well, thanks Thank again, you. Vic, and enjoy that leftover turkey. And WCAC guys and gals, stay on if you can for just another little 20 minutes or so. And everybody else, we're really happy that you joined us. And um, we thanks, Nancy. Talk to you again. Nancy? Yes. This is Robert. Before everybody disappears, um, uh, December 21st, 20. Uh, is the Jupiter Saturn um, conjunction? I was going. Everybody. To yep. Don't miss it, anybody. Don't. Yeah. Miss so, it. so if you don't know what I'm talking about, or maybe everybody here does, um, December 21st, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be so close to each other, uh, they may appear as a single star to the naked eye. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's worth finding out all by itself. Um, you whether, obviously don't live in upstate New York. Huh? <laughs> you obviously don't live in upstate New York. <laughs> hey, Dan, this is Nancy. I actually saw the Venus transit and a Mercury transit from central New York with you guys. So you, not doing too bad. <laughs> That's great. That's right. Right on. Right on. So, so basically, I just wanted to point that out before everybody exited because they didn't want to get bored. Yeah, that, that is, a, and, and the best part, as Robert mentioned, if you look at it through your uh, low level eyepiece, you can see Jupiter and Saturn and their respective moons all in one shot through the eyepiece. So that kind of conjunction, great conjunction doesn't happen very often and it is a not to be missed. Um, so circle it on your calendar, hang huge sticky notes all over your house, but yeah, don't miss that one. That one's awesome. Dust off your binoculars. And I'm going to text Ken that day so he doesn't forget. <laughs> so at any rate, um, I wanted to mention a few things to club members. We have, um, I don't know.